we're back. Think Tech is back on a given Friday, 11 o'clock in the morning, Trump week. Okay, Tim Apatella, Cynthia Sinclair, we're ready to go on Trump week. But in the title of our show, you're going to like this, is the rapper coming off the economy, lest we forget. And he's trying hard to avoid being blamed, but we know better. Okay, and before we get to that, which we got to get to, uh, we wanted to continue the discussion about the photo of Trump in El Paso. Tim, you wanted to say something else about that. You know, I do. Um, good morning, first. Um, I do want to, we kind of glossed over it at the last show, and I felt that was a moment in time for the presidency, any presidency, not to forget, is something of, of this kind of photo image of the, the orphan of that, of that child is the orphan of two parents that tried to shield that baby from the El Paso shooter. And so here we are in the hospital, and here's Donald Trump and Melania. It's a photo op. It's clearly a photo op. And what an inappropriate, horrific time for the you know, relatives of that family. And that's the uncle right there. And it's just one of those moments, I call it a, a visual of deplorable. Um, it's one of those moments in the presidency of this particular president that you just cannot erase from your memory. Um, I was just, just casually trying to remember similar, you know, similar moments of this presidency, and I came up with the following. Remember when he mocked the disabled uh, journalist, and he was mimicking his uh, the neuro, neuromuscular disability? That was a disgrace. That was a disgrace. Remember he was taking on the Gold Star family and, and oh. trying to you know, ha harass them? A Gold Star family. Remember when he was pushing aside um, the Prime Minister of Montenegro, that visual? And so he can get in front of the line and adjust his jacket and, you know, uh, there was a moment of a visual, a visual of, of a deplorable action. Remember when he basically said that John McCain wasn't a hero because he was captured? So this president just has moment after moment after moment of these, you these forgot, visuals. You forgot the time that he debased the American cemetery. In northern France. I did Normandy. forget that. Yeah. That was hideous. I did forget that. Um, then I forgot what he said in Helsinki about taking the word of Vladimir Putin versus his own intel agencies and not believing that Vladimir Putin and Russia got involved with the 2016 election. Uh, there's just so many that we can forget. So but how I don't do want to forget. The dots on this? Is well, this, I don't want to forget is them. Is it stupidity? Yeah. Is it stupidity? Mm -hmm. Is it loss of lack of character? Uh, is he trying to get our attention with outrageous remarks? What, why does he do this sort of thing? What motivates him? There's something missing. There's, I don't know what gene it is or what chromosome, but there's something missing within this individual. And he, I don't think he's conscious of it. I think it just comes natural. And it came natural for him to take that photo opportunity at that time with a big smile on his face and a thumbs up in the most worst of times to try to pull something like that off. I mean, everyone should say, what? What was he thinking? What was he doing? Well, it was almost as if he was sending a silent sort of signal to his base that, look, killed a bunch of Mexicans. You know, and that's what it seemed, that's what it said to me. Look, success, right? All these dead people. This child is an orphan. Oh. Success. All of Mexican descent. Yeah. Exactly. All of it. It's like success. And the thing, too, that struck me was that, you know, most of the, not, most all of the victims that were in the hospital refused to let him come and visit them. Right. So his only hope for a photo op was either with the hospital staff, which he did a little bit did. of, yeah. right? And then with this baby. And I find it hard to believe that he didn't offer money to this uncle to bring the baby back. All I know is it's a visual that will never be erased from my memory. It's and. Me for any presidency to have a collection of these memories attached to it, um, we'll never see something like this again in our lifetimes. Hey, let's talk about yep. something that's um, not as graphic, but is nevertheless profound. Let's talk about the stock market. Down um, 800 points this week. Yeah, twice. Twice, yeah. yeah. So what, what, what is going on with the stock market? And um, what is going on with um, you know, the economy? And what is going on with Trump trying to blame it all on his, his Fed uh, chairman? Yeah. Well, it's unfortunate that he's trying to blame it on the Fed chairman because I think the quotation was, 
he came in too late and too much um, as far as easing up on the Fed overnight rate. Uh, bottom line is he can't blame the Fed on this. This is a direct result of his tariffs. And if you notice that he actually finally took responsibility uh, to acknowledge that a tariff isn't just going to you know, impact China, he made and, and acknowledged that it was going to impact the consumers of this country, the Walmart shoppers. And why, how did he acknowledge that? Well, he extended the tariff increase till December 1st, <laughs> saying, I want to make sure that Christmas season isn't impacted by this. I'm buying you fools off. I'm buying you fools off. Okay. I don't think he realized what he was saying when he said that. Really? I really don't think he realized he was admitting that these tariffs do affect people in our country. I don't think he really realized I don't think that people he was get saying it. it. Yeah, I, don't I don't think, think they, they do either. I mean, even the farmers in Indiana and the like, they're still oh, Trumpers, even though their, their farms are going into bankruptcy, you know, by the carload. Well, there you go. They're, they're, no they're, get, they're getting it. They're getting papers of foreclosure. Yeah. They are. Only some of them, because some of them are starting to wake up and go, wait, you know, I'm taking, and I saw some interviews with some of them during this last week, and some of them are saying, yeah, and I'll take the handout, but I'd rather have, you know, three seasons worth of, you know, my product being grown and sold. These are some, some of these Chinese markets that they have, you know, they've been 40 years in the development. They're not going to be able to just reestablish them once Trump is gone or once Trump... Exactly, it's political. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. It's a political handout. It yeah. is. And meanwhile, their markets are disappearing permanently because permanently. China is buying yes. from other places. And it's not going to come back. And those connections will yeah. outlast Be Trump. Not. Yes, but, they will. You know, it's, it's really tough to say there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the tariffs and, you know, a pending recession. I mean, let's look at, we've been in a decade of economic growth. Sooner or later, all recessions come back. Okay? And that's where we are at. However, what was the catalyst of this recession? I do believe it is the tariffs. Yeah. Um, you see now an inverted yield curve on the two-year treasury. Right. And you see a flight, from, a flight to safety from the stock market to that two-year. Um, that's now adjusted up a bit uh, from the last couple of days. But the bottom line is we have a credibility problem, a concern. And it's not just the United States down the NASDAQ. It's, it's worldwide. Yeah, and I think, I think part of it, you know, you can say this is the tariffs and maybe, you know, the tariffs is a demonstration of it, is that, is that he's unpredictable. The United States is unpredictable. You can't rely on it anymore. Um, right. And this is, this is pretty serious uh, in terms of attracting foreign investment. For example, there was an article in the paper this week um, that, that uh, offshore investments in real estate in the United States and in Hawaii have dramatically shrunk over the last year. They no longer have confidence in the stability of our real estate market. They're not investing. They're down by a substantial percentage. I mean, a really big whopping percentage. Well, a big part of that was the Chinese investors, and they're having a hard time getting their money out of China now. Well, that takes us to our relationship with China, isn't yeah. it? I mean, uh, <clears throat> the, um, the uh, animosity that you might expect from Xi Jinping has filtered down to the street because the propaganda machine, and in China everything is part of the propaganda machine, has, uh, has, has turned public opinion against the United States. So if you ask the average fellow on the street, he's going to be angry at the United States for having, for having disabused uh, uh, China's economy this way. At the same time, and I find this really extraordinary in the context of the, the Hong Kong riots, which right. are really important, we need to talk about that. Um, Trump is saying, uh, Xi Jinping is my buddy. We have a wonderful relationship. Wait a minute, we're having a trade war for a year now. It's really awful trade war. It's so aggressive. And he's the one who started it, lest we forget. And he's the one who continues it and accelerates it and exacerbates it all the time, every week. It's his biggest distraction from other things in which he has failed. <clears throat> but he says, Xi Jinping, he's my buddy. Are yeah. you kidding me? This is doublethink. That's what it is. Out of George Orwell, it's doublethink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the context of that remark was what, was what is going on in Hong Kong. He's not really supporting the protesters who are protesting for democracy in Hong Kong. He's supporting Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping is doing things that are very, you know, potentially murderous in terms of dealing with those protesters. Well, you want to make sure it's not another Tiananmen Square for sure. And he should be more forceful as a president of the United States and a spokesperson for liberty. 
He's not. He's not saying he's anything. He's staying quiet about all of it. Even the white supremacists, you know, they're some really nice people. It's the same yeah. sort of thing. Right. And even those troops who were going to who were lining up in Shenzhen in the soccer stadium with their armored personnel carriers ready to come across into Hong Kong and shoot people, they're really nice people too, just like the supremacists. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, this is like weird. It's like the baby picture. Well, that's, weird. I'm glad weird. you said that because right. I, that just came into my mind. It's just... I, I keep using the word obtuse. It's just so obtuse to these obvious things of, of you know of humanity, and he just doesn't get it. It's well, kind of period. A, it's we kind of a common thing for narcissistic people to be that way yeah. because they kind of put themselves above everybody else. They think they're better than everyone else, and so they live in this sort of strange bubble where they don't even realize because they think they're so entitled to what they have and their thoughts and their ideas. They just assume everybody should think the same way, yeah. too. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I think what we have here is that you know, narcissism is a pretty serious problem if it's the president of the United States. Right. Really, I mean, if it was me, I'd have the 25th Amendment rolled out immediately. And if yeah. that didn't work, I'd have, I'd have a regular old-fashioned impeachment, you know? Well, Scaramucci is basically indicating that the, pre the president is off the wheel, off the, off the track. He's falling off the track. He's getting worse. Power is going to his head. Yeah. I saw right. Scaramucci on uh, Bill Maher a couple of days ago. Right. Scaramucci's off the track, too. Yeah. <laughs> He's know. kind of a nutcase. So, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> and, you, no, you, and you keep thinking, how could he have been elected to serve in the White House? He's off the track. He was there 18 days before Trump fired him. It was like a reality show. Well, the whole government is like a reality show. Right. Well, let, let, let me answer that, answer that question. Trump said it himself. I depend on the media to do my vetting for me. When they were bringing in the uh, new uh, proposed deputy of the National Intelligence Agency, he said, "Well, the media does my vetting." Yeah. What kind, of all wet and I what kind of crazy? Con First off, he hates the media, but now I'm going to let him do all my vetting for all my staff picks. What kind of crazy talk is that? So you know what I get? You know, always looking for common you know threads, denominators. Always looking connect connect the dots is that his promises that he started out with, this is really a challenge for the American people who really don't get all the news and they don't process the news very well. Sorry to say, this is a real threat to our democracy that mm -hmm. people do not get and process, and process the news. Exactly right. He's failed in so many promises. He's failed. I mean, he made bad promises and then he failed in the promises. And then he doubled down on it. Um, and now he blames someone else. Um, you know, this, the whole sequence of events is, is really nutcakes. And that is what we're seeing. And we're going to see more of that. And the question is, is whether the American people understand what's going on. I mean, look at North Korea. North Korea filing, firing missiles every, every few days. Yeah. And they made a threat on, on South Korea. They said they were never going to have a, a peace talk with South Korea again. This is Kim Jong-un going you know, bonkers. Um, <clears throat> what, what has he succeeded with? And, in bringing China to where he wanted, although nobody knows what he wants from China. Nobody knows what he wants. That's correct. It's well, just beat up China. It service all right. those anti-Chinese elements in the country. Um, and what has he achieved in Europe, except to you know, d divide it so that Russia could conquer it? Incredible. Right. Yeah. And so what kind of success actually has he had? In, and the Tax Reform Act was for the rich, I mean, there's no legislation that he has passed that means anything for the benefit of the country. Pushing coal, really? You know, you see this story on 60 Minutes about coal ash and how it is critically dangerous, you know, carcinogenically dangerous to anyone around the coal ash. Um, and all these things considered, and no promise was worthy, and no promise he has kept, and yet the case supports him. Really, no. what a statement about our country. And, and commentator after commentator says, no, he's going to win. He's going to win. Oh, my God. Well, not only the support him, but they really think he's accomplished a lot. And I'm going, what specifically? He rolled back regulations. You know, they wanted that. Well, there we go. That's yeah. what they think is a good thing. Oh, we don't need to fix those endangered species anyway. Who, who cares? Needs a, Just who needs let them go. American bald eagle. Yeah, we don't need them. <laughs> Grizzly bears, who needs them? We don't need them. <laughs> So that's the kind of stuff that's that the they worst. think. Well, they wrapped themselves around the flag, and he literally did it that one day. Well, that uh, made me sick. Then on, on I stage. saw him do that. So, you know, if, if the, the bald eagle, which was an endangered species, 
uh, is so near and dear to the patriotism of the Republican Party, why do they not spark up on this issue of, of gutting the Endangered Species Act? You know, we, we have a, a regular uh, guest on the shows uh, by the name of Julian Gorbach. He's a journalist. He teaches at the journalism program at UA. And he says, all of these issues are unimportant compared to the most important story of our lifetime, which, which persists and continues and gets worse every day. Can, no, you guess, the, can you guess what he's talking about? It was the hottest July in history. That's it. And yeah. 200 billion tons of ice have melted in Greenland. Just Greenland alone. That's that why doesn't... he wants to buy Greenland instead of Puerto Rico. I know it. <laughs> but you know, maybe you should buy Puerto Rico because they have no tax there. He, he won't need any other fancy tax legislation to escape taxes if he moves his residence to Puerto Rico. Oh, he can go there. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> That may they not won't be a take true him. statement. They won't but, take him as I right. I guarantee okay, After the way he treated change, them. Back to climate change. I mean, climate, climate change, change should always yeah. be a part of our discussion. Yes. Because it is the thing that is going to kill billions of people. Kill billions of people. Literally the hottest July in the history of our planet since they started measuring the heat. Since they started doing the measuring. Yeah. That's a and, lot. and he's doing nothing about it. In fact, he's making it worse. Yeah. He's making it worse. And, and his friends are making it worse. His... his, his right. What do you call it? His uh, sole proprietorship government is making it worse. Right. His oil and gas buddies are yeah. making it worse. And that is the most incredible thing of all. And he's demoralized <clears throat> the whole climate change movement. Well, he's wrapped these issues into the liberal, to the liberals, taking care of the planet. That's a liberal issue. Um, taking care of our national parks. Those liberals want to make sure I can't get my oil companies in there to develop. Uh, to take care of the Endangered Species Act. Wow, that's certainly a liberal issue. So he's very, very forcefully defined every issue that should be a nonpartisan issue into a liberal issue. Yeah. And they just, yeah, that's a liberal issue. Now I'm against it. Right. Yeah. It, it politicized even science. You know, it, it, you know um, blacking out, uh, what do you call it, uh, redacting scientific terms in government documents. Uh, re telling people not to refer to climate change and global warming, incredible. I mean, it's it's double think again. It's um, it's uh, it's alternative facts, but the reality is we have the hottest summer, and when you think of heat and energy that way, when you think of you know, carbon emissions that right. way, you know that the flip side of all that is extreme weather, right. and it's Absolutely. coming, and it's going to destroy cities. And he takes it one step further, the USDA, remember how he moved them from um, a place that, you know, in Washington where they had a say, they had a seat at the table, all of that. He moved the agency to somewhere in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, I think, something like that. And yeah, and so all of these scientists, the USDA guys, right, are, they don't want to move to Kansas. And so they're quitting. And then, and who was it that said, that worked out really well? We didn't actually have to fire them. They just quit. See how good that worked. And I, I can't believe what I'm listening to. These are scientists. So this is our food we're talking about. These aren't just, you know, these sort of lofty ideas of climate change. This is what we eat every day is no longer going to be studied in the way that it and was. I tell you, billions of people will be killed in this process. Yes, they will. And so the question I put to you is, you know, we've, we've talked about his boorishness. This is clear for a long time, even way back when, including misogyny. Right. Um, we've talked about the strange remarks he makes, which make you wonder about the process in his mind. Uh, we talked about his promises that are empty and, and he nevertheless doubles down how he creates racism, racism and divisiveness mm -hmm. in, in every day in every way in, in order to hold on to his base, I guess. Um, what about him thinking? What about the end of the story? When, when the newscasters get on and say he's probably going to win next year, I really, that's when I get up and go to the refrigerator. I have to, <laughs> I have to soothe my... Oh, yes, stress eating is not a good thing. But, but let's not forget the projection element of what he does. And I try to really look at everything he says through that lens. If he accuses somebody else of doing it, then he probably has been the one who did it. That's because you're smart. And, and we can figure that out. But what about the base? They don't figure don't, that out. 
Uh, they think I'm when he doubles sure, down, he's right. I'm not sure they want to figure it out. Again, we've said this on countless shows. We're dealing with a population, and I don't know if it's 35% or 40%. They don't care because they're dealing with a cult of personality. If he tells them to take a jump off a short pier, they'll do it. Well, it'll be suicidal. I mean, for them. They'll do it. You know, the thing about it is that there's a tipping point, I believe. I want to be optimistic about it. The tipping point. You know, the economy crashes, and we have a dust bowl in the, in the Midwest, his very, you know, base-oriented place. Um, the farmers just go completely out of business. There isn't anything. They can't grow anything. Um, we have... Um, Oh, gee whiz, we have wars and troubles everywhere in the world. Uh, uh, our relationship with China leads them to, as you have suggested, Jim, um, to uh, not renew their, their bond holdings with us. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, so it's climate change, it's the economy, it's all the promises that never happened. It's, it's a world of disorder, which will hurt us and touch us in so many ways. Where's the tipping point? Where, when's, when's the newscaster going to come on and say, he's not going to win? He's messed it up too bad. He's going to win because he's going to cheat. I keep saying this over and over. I know. He's going to cheat. He will sit himself in the White House and say, oh, no, there must have been voter fraud. or And this is what I'm kind of thinking. Rigged, why, rigged. why he doesn't want this election security to happen. Because then he can't manipulate it as well. right? I was watching the um, election security commission uh, hearings that happened yesterday, the big giant one, and there was so much said about, you know that all of our voting machines are Windows 7? It's like Windows 10 is already out. For a long time it's been Windows 10. So no wonder that 12-year-old kid could hack our voting machines so easily. And she did it in less than 20 minutes, and we even. And we've done nothing to That's change a, that. To have Congress do nothing. But let's, let's turn to gun control, because just a 48 hours ago, there was another attack. It was barely a week after the, the ones in uh, uh, El, 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 El Paso and Dayton. El Paso yeah. and, and Dayton. Dayton. Um, so now we have in Philadelphia, we have a guy, of, actually a bunch of guys, oh, right. who had some pretty strong weaponry and held the police off it and, uh, and killed, not killed, but wounded yeah, a half a dozen cops. Six of them, yeah. Luckily, it didn't kill anyone, but, but it would have been killed just as easily. Right. So, I mean, it's like there's a rhythm, there's a beat going on. And yet, and yet you know, what Trump and uh, uh, your friend uh, uh, Moscow McConnell. Uh, I'm Moscow saying, Moscow Mitch. <laughs> my <laughs> bud, Moscow I, Mitch. I say your friend because I know he's not my friend. Hey, the name's stuck, too. It <laughs> seems have, to have stuck. They want to put it off. They want to kick it down the road. Right. They don't want any gun control. I find this completely irrational. And unresponsive to the wish of most people in the country, even Republicans. And yet, the reality is there is no gun control, no, no bill, no legislation. Deja vu all over again, as, as um, a famous sports figure said. And, and, and it's Yogi the same Vera. thing that, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's Parkland all over again. Trump saying, we're going to do changes, we're going to make changes to this, and we're going to have we're going to have effective gun control. Well, he's great when he makes these statements, but why would anyone ever believe him? He doesn't mean what he says. He just doesn't mean it. And, uh, you know, he can sit down with uh, uh, LaPierre or, uh, you know, the NRA all he wants. They're telling him what to do. They're not, he's not telling them what to do. It's amazing, even though they're in disarray. Even though they're fighting among themselves. It's amazing themselves, how much power they still retain when they're in disarray. It's extraordinary. And not only the organization itself, but... Their base, you know what I mean? Yeah. The people who belong, they're, they're all gone. Why? I mean, do they really need to have guns? It's so, so important to them. They need to have people shooting at the police. You know, the thing about shooting at the police is different. Different than El Paso, different than Dayton, different than the school shootings. Those people, <laughs> you know, were soft targets in those places. Right. They couldn't shoot back. You know, and even if one of them had a gun because he was a Second Amendment Person and he mm -hmm. carried around a sidearm. They didn't use it. You know, at the end of the day, those guys with the sidearms are chicken. They're not going to turn around and risk themselves. They're going to run. Well, <clears> plus <throat> they made it very confusing. How are the police supposed to know who the real shooter is if you've got and people running around that's with their a, own guns? That's a really good point. You know, if if you if you have everybody shooting it up, it's uh, what, what's the right. uh, term? It's the OK Corral, okay. Right. and nobody knows who to shoot at. Right. So it's not a good idea to arm everybody in the thought. 
think that's going to, they're going to protect each other. They are not going to protect each other. Anyway, we have kids, we have people in a shopping center, all these soft targets. Um, these are cop guys. These guys were shooting at cops willy nilly. It's different. And what it, it tells you a couple of things. One is, how do you protect yourself if the cops can't protect themselves? Who is that says, you want to be a cop? Yeah. <laughs> be a right. Cop? Well, they were serving a warrant on the yeah. guy, too, yeah. when, when the shooting broke business. out, right? right? Somehow, the people they were serving the warrant on were excited by the fact there had been all, there has been all these shootings around. Right. They fell right in the niche. Yeah. You know? This country is becoming fascinated with not only guns, but active shooters. It's a scenario that repeats and repeats. Well, they're fascinated with automatic weapons, you know, that, that are designed for war. And, you know, maybe they're thinking of the great apocalypse is around the corner and they need those rifles to... Didn't Lindsey Graham just say this just a couple of days ago? They, he may need his AR-15 to, you know, stem off um, massive uh, invasions due to a natural disaster? What? He said it a couple of days ago. Yes. Lindsey well, Graham said, I, I may need my AR-15 in case there's a natural disaster and I have to protect my homestead. I mean, the I don't know. I can't make this stuff up, guys. It's not going to help uh, the, the electronic invasion by the Russians, which is That's probably happening happen. right now. You know uh, that they just said they've got all these tanks and um, they've got all these aircraft that are already loaded and parked right on the Russia border right, that's just across from Alaska. And then let's not forget about Venezuela. They've got those two big uh, nuke-carrying planes down there in that. They, they are on both sides of us already right now. But Russia's a friend, yeah. according to, the, to his base. Yeah. They're our friends now. Of course they are. They're willing to put... Okay, and that's the other thing. This whole thing with Moscow Mitch and his little, you know, six or eight billion dollar, or eight hundred billion dollar, whatever deal it was. Hundreds of millions. It was a lot, for yeah. the benefit of Kentucky, um, right? Through Deripaska's company, um, Yersal or Russell, 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 right? Aluminum, okay. yeah. This is one of the things that I read in the New York Times that I thought was a fascinating article about how they have gone and done, it's an economic invasion is what they do, so that then they can um, exert pressure from inside, like, and this whole thing with you know Moscow Mitch is the perfect example of that. They have done it all over Europe. It's not like they're just learning how to do it now here in America. They've practiced it. They've got it down to a fine art. They have been out and interfering with public policy and everything else all throughout and Europe. Voting and, and voting everything. And divisiveness in well, every country. Everywhere. And it's <clears throat> Economic, and that's the new way that they are really what? going after. It's called political action campaigns. It's called money. It's called money, money in Washington D.C. Yep, it's that simple. They're doing, well, or Kentucky. What they're doing in Europe, they're doing here. They're doing yeah. everywhere. They're and doing they it everywhere. They've really gotten to be experts. And if we don't stand up and do something about it and take the blinders off our eyes, and sometimes I get really frustrated with the liberals because they're so. Hey, back, liberals. Well, let's take like, one minute angry. more before Stand we close up and our say no show more. and talk about uh, the next debate and how that's looking. I guess right. Tulsi didn't make the grade, um, hmm. uh, but but Tom Steyer did. did. He did. Tom, he's yeah. really a promising guy. I saw him speak in, in where was it Boise? He was fabulous. Yeah. Um, but where is it going with the Democrats? So this is the last question to discuss. Where is it going with the Democrats? What does it look like? Is there a leader emerging? Looks like the numbers are Biden and uh, Elizabeth Warren. Warren. Warren's number two now. Yeah. She's moving right yeah. up. And I, I uh, you know, I, I don't resist thinking that maybe they could be a great ticket together. Because mm -hmm. uh, what one doesn't have, maybe the other one does. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? Yeah. I said it about two shows ago. This is the John McCain issue because of Biden's age. Um, Warren would not be the best pick because there are many people that said, well, we'll say, I can't, I can't see her as president. And if she's only a heartbeat away from that office, um, this is why John McCain lost the presidency. I think they couldn't see Sarah Palin as the next yeah. president of the United States. I, I think comparing Palin and Warren is unkind. 
I do too. I do too. Okay, I'll grant you that. I will. I will agree to that. However, there are independents and even Republicans are begging for somebody else they can pick besides Trump. Or well, they're begging for it. They've got well, and, but and, they don't and, like and, him. And Warren wouldn't be that person. Okay, maybe someone else. Well, now we'll see, have to see how it shakes the out. Age but but factor. she is number two. She's yeah. number two now, yeah. which I think is okay. The age factor is why I don't think that two of them would make a good ticket. Now, see, the ticket I'd like to see is Warren as president and maybe Beto O'Rourke as, as her second. And he's, off um, the, he's off the chart. He tried to relaunch, but it's uh, uh, I don't know. I didn't like his relaunch didn't work. thing as well. But, or somebody young, at any rate. Someone young. Her, because that's one of the big things with millennials well, right now is everybody's too old. Okay, bottom line is we, somebody we don't have anybody who really comes to mind as the as the guy who could lead us out of the, out of the, the Trump swamp uh, yeah, and no. beat him. And secondly, um, you know we we, we don't have um, you know a mm, anything that attracts people from the middle or, or from the conservatives. Correct. Correct. This is this is a problem. Yes. Uh, so we need to be stimulated. The country needs to be stimulated. And, and I'm so worried that for the lack of that, Trump will win because he's real focused well, on Trump. But he's just going to cheat. You've got to so. stop making the assumption that if, <laughs> let's say, Biden is our nominee. I, I wouldn't make the assumption he's going to pick some, someone from the, the field of candidates. Yeah, he might pick someone, completely, pick someone completely outside the field. That's true. Steyer. Could be. Watch Tom Steyer. And when we get back next week, we're going to take a closer look at Tom Steyer with Tim Apicella, Cynthia Sinclair, here on Trump Week, one of our best and favorite shows. Aloha. All right. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Yeah. <laughs>